Hi beauties, welcome back to day six of Halloween. We are on the cusp of the end. I hope you guys have enjoyed the series so far. It has been a ton of fun and a ton of work to film, but um, we've really enjoyed it, I think, both Nikki and I. Here on Halloween Eve, what are we gonna talk about? Well, today's outfit is mainly a face outfit. So yes, the, 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 the clothing matches like it has been, but that's not the primary focus. Today I'm wearing my, my Haunted Mansion spirit jersey from Disney. So I was trying to think about something Haunted Mansion related that I could do. And I came up with the one, the only Madame Leota. She of course is the, the psychic teller, the ghost, the spirit of the psychic who is in the crystal ball. So the only thing that she is is a head. Um, if you know what she looks like, she's got kind of like blue greenish skin and this like very wild, blue greenish hair, which of course that wig that we use for the clown look is going to be perfect for. So yeah, so I was like, let's do that. It will be um, a really fun and very experimental look. So hopefully it turns out the way I'm kind of thinking. Basically the only thing I'm, I'm thinking for her is just blue glam. That's, that's it. That's really, that's the, I'm gonna look like a Smurf, but make it glam. So yeah, so that's what the that's what the game plan is today. So what are we gonna talk about with this particular one? There's so much to talk about with Disney that has got like some kind of creepy things to it. So I decided let's look up real cases of Disney deaths and tragedies that have happened on the park. So uh, before we even pre like, let me just preface this before we even jump into it. I don't mean any disrespect to any people who um, who I'm talking about in these stories. These are real people, uh, real tragedies. People lost their lives. And so I do, as I talk about it, I mean it with the utmost respect and reverence for what happened to them. So just so you guys are aware of that, um, but I've got a good number of cases. Some of them do have ghost stories attached to it. I included those because personally I believe in ghosts and do I think that they could be um, real? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. Some people don't, so that's why I also wanted to give it, there is the, the, the real aspect of the tragedy too. So. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's jump into our, where I'm gonna do green, like high, like highlighter, uh, concealer, cause I, she's blue green. So I've got blue, a green concealer and I've got blue. We're gonna see if this will work. And the white did really well with the clown. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I've got high hopes for this guy. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about is Dolly. And she is a pretty famous spirit in Disneyland in Anaheim, California. Um, in 1984, she uh, was a young woman named Regina George, but she was nicknamed Dolly. They were on the Matterhorn ride, which personally I have not ridden because I, I don't think, at least if there was, I don't think there is anymore. I don't think there is one in Disney World and I have not been to any of the parks besides Disney World. But from what I understand about the Matterhorn, it's kind of like this like bobsled, I think. I may be wrong. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Her seatbelt had been undone on that and it's kind of unsure if, if she was standing or if it just, you know, if her friend had undone it, if she had undone it, something happened. She wound up falling off of the cart and she was struck and killed by another oncoming bobsled. So the legends nowadays say that her spirit is still there and a lot of cast members have reported that they feel eyes on them when they do their final walkthrough of the rides because at the end of the night they have to walk through the rides to, to make sure nobody is, is lagging behind, nobody was left behind, everybody's out of the parks. And most of the time they report in that particular section where Dolly fell off of that they can feel someone watching them or they feel uncomfortable or they feel like they're not alone there even though nobody else is there with them. So that part of the ride now actually is known as Dolly's Dip. I think this, there's a couple ghosts that um, that like the cast members know to say hi to, otherwise they're gonna have a bad day. I believe Dolly is one of them that they normally will greet in the mornings, but I did not write that down, so. So that is Dolly's um, story, her, her tragedy, and that is one of the most well-known ones, I think. A lot of people, um, when you're researching it, there's a lot of stories about it, a lot of people talk about it, a lot of the cast members who have worked in the Anaheim location talk about that. So yeah, so that's Dolly's story. The next one, this one, they're all tragedies, but this one was incredibly sad for me. I don't know why, but every time, because I, I read a couple different articles and listened to a couple different like podcasts and stuff talking about this particular case, and it's just really heartbreaking. Uh, this is the case of Deborah Stone, and this one also took place in Disneyland in Anaheim, California. I'm gonna go ahead and say a lot of these stories come from Disneyland Anaheim, California. I don't know what that says. I just feel like there's a lot more sketchy stuff that happens there. I don't know, I'm not judging, I'm just saying it's, there's a little bit of a pattern. Deborah Stone, Debbie Stone, um, 
This was in Disneyland in 1974. And she was 18 years old and had just graduated from high school and was getting ready to go off to college. So over the summer, she got a job at Disneyland to save some money before she left for school. She was assigned a hostess position at the recently renovated and updated America Sings ride. And America Sings, uh, had opened in June of 1974. So she started working there during the summer. It literally opened like right at the same time that she was hired there. Uh, it had previously been the Carousel of Progress and both rides com were comprised of like singing air animatronic animals that moved around and switched scenes on this rotating stage. It was the same general layout as the Carousel ride, but it was just slightly different. They had sent the Carousel ride to uh, Disney World in Florida so that they, they always do that kind of stuff. They like trade rides with parks and, or, and all that kind of interesting stuff, which I was like, that's interesting. All right, I'm, I'm just taking a pause on this story really quick. I'm interested to see if the blue is going to work the way I hope it is. It's, it's very blue. I'm kind of thinking if I can just get it a nice like blue tone which it looks like it may do, then I can go in and set it with eyeshadow that's blue and it may make it dark enough. Debbie's role as the hostess was to greet each new group of guests as they took their seats in the audience. And then she would stand to the left of the stage. She would announce that the ride was going to start. The outer ring of the carousel where the audience was sitting would begin to move. On July 8th, uh, 1974, which I believe was only about 10 days after the ride had opened, to the public, there was a horrible tragedy at around 11 p.m. Debbie was actually caught in between the rotating carousel and the wall uh, backstage. And nobody noticed until they heard her scream. And by that point it was too late. So she was trapped and crushed in between the walls and um, the audience members and the cast members working there all heard it. They closed the ride for two days, which I mean, I feel like that is not enough time, but capitalism doesn't stop. So they closed it for two days. They added a few safety features and um, eventually they actually made that wall backstage a breakaway wall so that if anybody were to be trapped in it again, um, it would actually just kind of release and they would be set free, um, which is a smart, that's incredibly smart. I was like, I didn't even know you could do that in a standing foundation, but I guess that makes sense. So they they did take precautions to try and, and keep that from happening ever again. However, the ride itself did remain open until April 10th of 1988, which is almost 15 years later. Of course, with that, uh, rumors also began to spread that Debbie's ghost remained uh, as a kind of watchful guardian of the uh, the ride instead of being you know malicious or or anything she kind of made it her duty to make sure nobody else would get hurt in the same way that she was hurt the rumors were basically that people if they were stu too close to the wall when it began to rotate they would hear soft whispers of a woman saying to be careful okay that took a ton of time so i did uh, the rest of it off camera uh, i wound up using a majority green concealer instead of the blue and i mixed a little bit of blue this and then a little bit of eyeshadow and that wind up for a minute, I look like Elphaba, but it, you know, here we are. So, riding the ship. Okay, moving on. So, next story that I want to talk about is the the story of Thomas Guy Cleveland, which also happened in Disneyland Anaheim in 1966. And it was June of that year, and Disneyland always hosts a grad night. Cleveland, who was 19 years old and had just graduated, decided that he did not want to pay for a ticket and would try instead and break into the park through the employee parking lot. So he scaled a 16 foot fence in order to gain access to the parking lot. Once there, he climbed onto the monorail tracks. And if you've never been to one of the Disney parks, the monorail is essentially a train that goes um, way up in the air and it'll take you from different parking garages, different parks, uh, it pretty much just goes all over the place. Um, it is incredibly convenient and incredibly fast and those rails are very high up. So it's very dangerous. He ends up on the track. I don't know what his plan was. I don't know if his plan was to walk to the park on the rail. I don't know if his plan was to try and get onto one of the decks from there and I, I don't know. Unfortunately, he timed it perfectly that one of the monorails was just a, a small distance away. And a security guard actually noticed him and screamed for him to jump down. But instead he tried to duck down into the rail part and hope the train would go over him 
um, and unfortunately it did hit him. And um, the worst part was the, the conductor, they did not know that they hit him. They didn't see him at all. Um, the people on the bus or on the train didn't know at all. Um, they said basically they felt a small bump, an unusual bump, and then the emergency broke. Uh, they hit the emergency brakes in order to, to stop it to make sure everything was okay. And his body had been dragged for about 40 feet on the trail. So of course he, um, he had died instantly. Those trains just for an understanding of how awful the situation really was, they go about 25 miles an hour. There was no chance of him surviving it more or less. There is also a ghost story that goes along with Thomas, kind of like a precautionary tale, like not to do that again, how terrible of an idea that was. And basically people say that only at night they see on the tracks, they'll see a shadowy figure. As soon as the monorail comes near him, he disappears. So that is um, the unfortunate story of Thomas and what he went through with that. The next story is from the Florida location, the Orlando location. And this one happened really recently. In fact, I vividly remember when the news was covering this and it was going on. But this is one of those where it really was just kind of like a, oh my gosh, uh, for, and the whole world kind of watched this one. I know the entire country, the entire United States was very focused on this case when it was happening. I think it, it made national news as well. It was such a tragedy and it is the story of Lane Graves, who was a four-year-old who died at the Grand Floridian in 2016. Lane was on vacation with his family and they were staying at the Grand Floridian Hotel, which is one of the larger hotels on Disney property. His parents were close by, but they were near the water and they were letting him kind of play near the water. Now I will say, there are signs all over the Disney parks to not go near the water because there are there are tons of dangerous things in there. And it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty well known that, that Florida is like covered in swamplands and has alligators and all different sorts of creatures. So it is an absolute tragedy and there's nobody, I, I don't think it's right to blame anybody, but there are, it's hard to blame Disney as well because there are signs everywhere. But basically what his parents reported was that they were only a few feet away from him they were fine and then in a split second they heard a splash and they turned around to see young Lane being dragged into the water by an alligator. Um, they spent 16 hours that day looking for him. They dredged the lake, they, they did everything they could, um, but unfortunately when his body was recovered, he had drowned and also suffered a neck injury. So uh, it was really just a horrible tragedy. Like I said, the news coverage of it, we mean, for days we were hearing about this tragedy of this little boy who was killed by the alligators and and it's hard to, it's, you wanna blame somebody, you wanna point fingers, but it's, at the end of the day, parents lost their child and, and you know, Disney, I don't think Disney can be blamed for this one either. So the family ultimately decided not to sue. Um, no lawsuits or anything came of this. It was just a really horrible tragedy and a little boy was lost in such a, a tragic way at such a young age and in what should be the happiest place on earth. So yeah, and I, I, I definitely want to include that one, wanted to include that one just because I do, I think anybody who uh, focuses on the news probably at least remembers a little bit about when that case came out because we did hear about it for so like weeks we were hearing about it it was I'm pretty sure there was like our articles in People magazine and stuff it just really was one of those things where you're like oh my gosh like what a, what an absolute tragedy continuing on with the fun topic of very young deaths sorry guys I'm not meaning for this to be heavy I'm meaning for it to be entertaining but this is the case of Joel Good who was also in Orlando Florida but this one happened in 1977 and Joel was also four years old and he had been at the Magic Kingdom parks with his family um, for the whole day and I kind of saw different things I was trying to find that it's hard when a lot of, a lot of people will talk and write about these kind of stories because they it is a horrible way to describe it, but I really don't know how else to say. There's almost a fascination with the, the tragedies that happen at Disney because it is the happiest place on earth. So it's like, this shouldn't happen, but it, it does. And it happens everywhere. And it, you know, with as long as Disney's been around, of course there's gonna be deaths and tragedies and, and, and horrible situations. So I think that there's almost this kind of like, when we talk about it, people are so focused on it. So, so you will find a lot of like people talking about the cases and because of that, there's a lot of different information out there. So I couldn't kind of, I kind of had trouble finding certain things about this case. So Joel had been at the family all, or at the park at Magic Kingdom all day with his family. And from what I saw the most, which is what I'm gonna go with, it was later, he and his family stopped to get ice cream and they were sitting on a bench 
eating, all of a sudden his mother just couldn't find him. She didn't know what happened to him, didn't know where he had went. And so of course they go to park security immediately and they're like, we can't find our son. They spent a good while. I don't, I never saw like an exact time. Like I didn't see like with Lane's case, it said 16 hours. They spent a little while looking for him. And um, unfortunately when they finally found him, his body was recovered in the moat around Cinderella's castle. Um, there had been a two foot guardrail there, but it wasn't enough to keep him from falling in and um, unfortunately had fallen in and drowned. It's only five feet of water, but of course it's not, I mean, it's not dirty water, but it's also like exposed to the element. So as much as I'm sure they filter it and everything to make it look nice, it's not clean water. And this was a four-year-old child who I'm sure did not know how to swim. It was a huge tragedy. And what followed this was a huge lawsuit that lasted, I think for a good while. Basically the original judge in the case um, when the parents sued Disney World threw the book at the mom more or less and said, why were you not paying attention to your child? It's kind of one of those situations where I do understand the judge's point of view. I know it's hard to point blame, but Disney is Disney's a scary place. And I mean that in the nicest way possible, but I went as an adult. I never went as a kid. I never went with little kids. And there are people everywhere and there are people moving all the time. It's just, it's a fast paced environment. You gotta really be diligent about keeping track of whoever you're with. It doesn't matter if they're a little kid or an adult. And so the judge basically said that he had, she had neglected her duties and failed to control and keep an eye on a child of such a tender age. And that was the verbatim that he used was the word tender age. So she actually filed a countersuit a year later and the court of appeals basically decided that the blame should be placed equally on Disney and on the parents, not just on the parents. And because of that, um, the family was actually awarded $1.5 million, which was about half of what they were suing for, which is why, because they decided equal blame. That's why they, they wound up getting a less than what they were asking for, but still a very substantial amount of money. I just come back to, that one is one of those cases where I, I Sometimes you can look at it and go like, oh yeah, Disney's me, man, they are really to blame for this one. That was a hard one for me because you, when you are, oh my God, I don't know what just happened with that sheet, but oof. But when you are in those parks, you just have to be so careful in so many ways. I mean, and, and this is how this tragedy could have ended, but you, once again, you're around strangers and there's so many people and there could be abduction, like you just don't know. And it is just such a different environment. And you wanna, you wanna have this sense of false security because it is the happiest place on earth. But at the end of the day, you just don't know. You don't know who you're surrounded by. You don't know what dangers are out there. So you, it's just so hard. The next case is incredibly depressing to me. This is one of the ones like Debbie Stone. Um, it's just so sad to, to think about, to hear about with this case. This is the case of Javier Cruz. Um, this also happened in Disneyland, Orlando. I mean, sorry, Disney World. I keep saying Disneyland. Disney World, Orlando, Florida. And this was in the year 2004. Javier was 38 years old. He was the father of, father of two. Um, and he had been an eight year veteran of the Disney parks at this time. Um, he was dressed as Pluto and they were about to start the Share a Dream Come True Parade, which was, it, I believe it's done now. When I was there, we never saw it. So I don't think that they do it anymore. But they used to do a daily parade around 3 p.m. And this was that particular parade. They were getting ready to leave. They were in the back parts of um, what they call like the backstage or whatever. So um, they're about to, to come out into the public and uh, he tripped and fell in front of one of the final parade floats. And there was not enough time to stop the float before it unfortunately ran over him. So he um, he was hit, very few people actually witnessed it, but it, there were a few cast members there who did notice um, him fall and, and tried to stop the float, but it just wasn't enough time. It was really just a horrible tragedy, I think for everybody, who, the people who witnessed it. Everybody had nothing but incredibly nice things to say about Javier. Um, just that he was an absolute, you know, treasure. His sister said that he was a wingless angel and he was a Disney character even when he wasn't in, in costume. She she just made him sound like an absolute delight. And, and so it was, once again, I mean, anybody's death is a tragedy, but somebody who loved to do this so much and then for him to be taken in that way was very much, um, I think, very shocking to the cast members who were there um, to his family, to everybody involved. And the worst part, in my opinion, was the family actually received no money for his death. The only fine that Disney was 
uh, forced to pay was a $6,300 fine to OSHA for a violation of code, basically saying they should have been, um, they should have had somebody with him and they should have had a, a bigger distance between him and the float in order to prevent something like this from happening. So really no justice for the family, no sort of compensation. And I know I know it's hard because money is not going to replace your family member who you've lost in such a horrifically tragic way, but it still, it just feels like to not give them anything, to just allow his children to not have a father. And, and it just seems like an absolute, um, kind of an abomination for a company as big as Disney that does have so much money give the family something. Okay, so it took me like 15 years to glue on my eyelashes. It feels like there's just coffins glued to them because they're just like straight boards. I'm so bad at lashes, but I wanted to have them on for this look. I'm actually, this is one of my favorite looks that we've done so far. It actually is very, very Madame Leota-esque. So uh, we're finishing up and I only have one more story that I wanna share with you guys um, from the Disney parks. This one is, I saved it for the last. I felt like it was necessary to include because this is a Haunted Mansion look and this is about the Haunted Mansion rides. But this is one of the ones where I kind of can see it being a little bit of a stretch because it's almost, it's almost like an easy target since it is the Haunted Mansion. So obviously it has like that creep factor that Disney is not often associated with. So this is the uh, the Haunted Mansion. I didn't know what to call it, but it's the Haunted Mansion Ashes is what I put it down as. There's stories from both Anaheim and Orlando, which also gives me pause because it's very weird that there's like the exact same story, story at both locations. But I will say it is very, I guess I didn't realize it until Nikki and I were talking about it. He it's like, oh yeah, that's a big problem. It is very well known that people will, after loved ones pass on, they will scatter their ashes on Disney property. So much so that Disney actually had to make it not only, not only just frowned upon, but a park policy that if you do scatter ashes, you will be uh, removed from the parks and possibly banned for the rest of this, of ever, forever. It actually was a pretty significant issue because of that. There's this kind of story that's that's emerged from both, uh, shockingly enough, from both the Anaheim location and from the Orlando location about a mother who scatters, and that's that's kind of where I'm like, is it true? Is it not true? Because they're both very similar. Basically, a mother scatters her her child's ashes on the haunted mansion ride, and now there's reports of. Um, crying and, and dis disembodied voices asking, where's my mommy? People have claimed to see the spirit of a young child. Um, in some accounts I've heard it is a boy. Uh, I believe the one that's in uh, Orlando is like known to be a boy. Uh, I've actually heard stories though as well of people saying they saw a little girl. So it's kind of one of those things like, is this urban legend? Is this just to give the Haunted Mansion a nice little, um, creepy tale to go with it. Sorry, it's very hard to talk and do this. That one is a very interesting one to me. I will say this is something that is very common. Um, this this story is very common among, among cast members. Some people theorize that this is just like a sense of hazing. Like they're like, oh, they get a creepy tale and they're always kind of unsettled when they're in the Haunted Mansion ride. I believe in ghosts, so absolutely it could be true. It could also be very fake. So it's just one of those that I don't know, but I wanted to include it because of course this is a Haunted Mansion ride. Look, so. Obviously got to tell the creepy story about Pawn and Mansion Ride. All right, so here she is, Madame Leota. I told Nikki off camera, I do also feel just a little bit like uh, old Greg. So am I old Greg? Am I Madame Le Leota? Does it really matter? No, it doesn't. I'm actually very happy with how this look turned out. I was really worried about it. Um, I knew it was gonna be a lot. The eyelashes are my least favorite part, but overall I, I feel like I really do kind of give off her vibe, especially the wig. The wig definitely brings this all together. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. We have one more day. This has been such a fun and very stressful process. So I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, definitely give us, a, give us a comment or anything. Tell me what you think about the stories. Tell me if you like the series. If you guys are enjoying this, then I will definitely start implementing stuff like this into the channel regularly. Um, cause I've had a lot of fun doing it, but yeah. Thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe if you like us, cause we love you guys and we'd love for you to be part of the family. And other than that, I hope you guys are all safe, healthy. You have a wonderful day and you stay girly with a dark twist and get ready for Halloween tomorrow.